Hey, everyone. Two quick announcements before today's Army Aviation Month episode. First, we checked and double-checked the microphones, but unfortunately, mine sounds like it did not record. So we have some slight audio challenges on this one, but you've always been very forgiving in the past, and I know you'll do it here too. So, you know, you build a thousand bridges. Anyway, second thing is we have some very cool special Army Aviation Month t-shirts available on our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com. Head on over there, go to the shop page, click on merchandise, and check out cool shirts with the designs from your favorite Army helicopter, including today's, the OH-58 Kiowa. All right, well, let's get to it. What's your sole purpose in this Army? To do whatever you tell me, drill sergeant. Lieutenant, tell your men to get down. We're going to light up the sky. We got a Black Hawk down. We got a Black Hawk down. Broke it out. You've heard Bomber Month. I'm saying it. Broke it out. We've had F-15 Month. I love the smell of my pump in the morning. Okay! Come on, let's move out! Well, hold on to your berets, because now it's Army Aviation Month. We have planes stuck up in every thousand feet, from seven to 35,000. We'll get them, sir! What kind of training, son? The first four Mondays in August will feature topics on fixed-wing Army aircraft, Army Flight School, various rotary wing aircraft, and the lethal AH-64 Apache gunship. Never mind the fluff. Let's get straight to it with your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Army training, sir! Army training, sir! Hello and welcome back to the third installment of Army Aviation Month here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I am your host, Jello. We're having a great time. And it keeps going this week with Ryan Robicho, who joins us to discuss the OH-58 Kiowa. How's it going, Ryan? Doing pretty good over here. Yeah, good. Thanks for joining us. Awesome, man. I've been looking forward to it for a while. Oh, no doubt. I think you and I first were connected probably a year ago at this point, and it took us a while to get around to Army Month, but we appreciate your patience. Anyway, so let's start with you, man. Where are you from? What did you do in the Army, and what are you doing now? All right, yeah. I grew up in Hot Springs, Arkansas. I attended Louisiana Tech. That's where I uh, actually initially joined the Army. I went to the uh, Louisiana Guard, uh, where I was an Army medic. My last year, I actually transferred back into Arkansas into uh, Henderson State University. They had the same aviation degree that I was pursuing there at La Tech, but they were basically going to accept the transfer credits like from my Army training, so I'd actually graduate sooner. So I pretty much got the same bachelor's from Henderson, and I ended up transferring into the Arkansas Guard at that point. And then uh, when I graduated, I rolled pretty much a couple months finishing up ratings and things, Then I went on to uh, active duty. I got selected for the uh, WAFT, you know, the Warrant Officer Flight Training Program, as it's called. Mm -hmm. So went over to uh, Fort Rucker and got to go through what is the fun of walk school and moved right off base to the little Daleville trailer park right there where all the other flight students that wanted to be cheap were. And uh, we just started rolling right through. Awesome. Yeah. Prior to that, you know, like came from kind of a military background. Like my father was a uh, Marine Corps A6 pilot. My brother was a ranger. He was actually in the Arkansas Guard as well. He led an infantry platoon in uh, Baghdad around the Otomia neighborhood in like 2004, where it's just (laughs) horrible. My uh, paternal grandfather, he was an army NCO. He was an infantryman. So he was fighting in the Philippines. Uh, in World War II. My uh, maternal grandfather was also in the Army. He was an Air Corps P-40 Warhawk pilot. So he was captured by the Japanese, actually, uh, after a pretty crazy time when Bataan fell and he tried to escape. And (laughs) it was this whole big thing. But he ended up in a uh, prison camp and escaping. And he would go out and join forces with local resistance fighters and bring medicine and all that back into the camp. And then he eventually got out and just started waging guerrilla war against the Japanese. But uh, <laughs> pretty crazy. You're like Lieutenant Dan. Your whole family is military, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just like I read this thing. It was a naval historian that had obviously, you know, crossed paths with him at some point and like wrote all this down for our family. I think he meant to like make it into a manuscript because we just have this rough draft and I just read it. I'm just like, dude, the things that those guys like World War II generation just leaves me in awe. It's nuts what those dudes did. So like that was kind of what shaped me into really wanting to pursue it and go like just kind of being just in awe of these like past generations. Like I was just like, man, like I need to do something and join this. Yeah. Well, that's why we call them the greatest generation. Yeah. All right. So you 
threw your hat in the ring, so to speak, and went through flight school. And we did have previous episodes here on Army Aviation Month about the Warrant Officer Flying Program and flight school. But once you got done with that, where did you end up? So went through flight school, went through uh, ALSI following that, just so I'd have a skill when I showed up at my unit, which is basically just like repairing the helmets and the life support equipment and all that, you know, the vests and all that kind of good stuff. So showed it to my unit in Savannah. And I don't think I was there more than a year. And we were pretty much, yeah, it was actually less than a year because then I ended up in Afghanistan pretty much doing some of my progression even was just right there in Afghanistan. We ended up in uh, Bagram Airfield. The unit actually split. So I was in 317 Cavalry. So we had three line troops originally. So it was Alpha Bravo Charlie Troop. And then for that deployment, uh, shortly before the deployment, or maybe six months out or something like that, they basically said, you know, we need an additional troop. So they kind of farmed between all the troops and made Fox Troop, which hadn't been stood up since like Vietnam. They went ahead and sent us, Fox Troop, over to Bagram to do um, basically base security and and operations right there in that Bagram Bowl area. So it was like us and the um, there's an attack company as well that kind of uh, Bravo 1-3 attack got separated and, and plugged in with us. So it was kind of cool because unlike a lot of the aircraft rivalry and all that kind of craziness, like I actually don't have a problem with the Apache guys because we just like lived and worked with them. Like they're basically in the same troop. So that was kind of cool. Mm-hmm. When were you in Bagram? I was there in uh, 11 and 12. Yeah, I showed up there in uh, late 09. So pretty much like uh, around Thanksgiving of 09 to Thanksgiving of 10. We were there for a year. All right. Yeah. Well, I was a little after you, but yeah, interesting place for sure. <laughs> so, Isn't it though? <laughs> yeah, that's putting it mildly, right? <laughs> uh, you were flying the OH-58 primarily? Yes, sir. Absolutely. That was pretty much my primary. You okay. Know, that was everything for us. So we lived on the east side of the airfield, which was kind of nice because at that time, like the west side of the airfield was just like miserable army post. You know, it was just a giant road, just people saluting all day, and just traffic and people everywhere. So we were like super fortunate to be on the east side of the field. We would kind of joke. There was actually a picture of like one of those little army gators, you know, people drive around and like it was up on blocks because someone had parked it on the east side. So it was just kind of like our own little area over there. And it was, we were behind a gate that yeah. was like secured by some air force guards. So it was, it, we were like, literally living on the airfield. So that was kind of cool that we were just kind of left alone. And, you know, our little huts, our little bee huts were a uh, hundred yards, maybe from the aircraft themselves. I mean, we could just sprint out of the bee huts and get right to the birds. That's cool. Well, except until the middle of the night when the F-16s decide they need to go somewhere. Yeah. So. You guys are totally <laughs> the reason that I own Bose. <laughs> <laughs> Sound canceling headphones, I think. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It was, just, it was actually my dad's old plane that the A6, you know, the EA6. Well, that thing's still flying. And I mean, mm-hmm. that thing just, it doesn't have afterburners to my knowledge. It just like skull drug itself off the runway. So just loud. <laughs> You are correct on both accounts. <laughs> awesome. All right, man. I guess we'll we'll save what you're doing now till the end, but let's get into the OH-58 and we'll just kind of cover the whole gambit on this thing. But let's start at the beginning. You know, what was this thing's background that was, how did it come to be? It began life as an observation and reconnaissance helicopter. So it traces its roots back to Vietnam. It kind of started life as a two blade, like a Bell 206. And it followed kind of a long lineage of cavalry scout tradition, like dating back to World War One. you know, like the army used to use balloons and biplanes to conduct recon and enemy troop movements and battlefield conditions. So it was kind of cool to watch. Like I was reading some of the history about just the air cavalry in general and kind of that scout attack mission. And so the Kiowa just kind of jumped right in there, you know, mid to later Vietnam. Over time, armament was actually added. Further mission equipment was installed to be better equipped to conduct more like the surveillance type stuff, like Cold War snooping around in the treetops and along ridge lines. Because like our foes at the time, you know, were were like military tank battalions, the Russians, you know, stuff like that. So like uniform standing military type stuff. Like my generation is generally after 9-11. So the requirements and tactics for the aircraft and just for the army as a whole had to adapt to these new enemies. So the insurgents that we fight, they employ really versatile guerrilla tactics. They blend in seamlessly to the local populace. So basically the Kiowa's combat role like broadened quite a bit. And we conducted a lot more close air support, routes, clearance patrols, convoy escorts, 
Uh, we would do general and photo reconnaissance. We'd do landing zone recon, security for lift aircraft, you know, like the Blackhawks, Chinooks want to go in, land, insert some people or drop some, you know, cargo, whatever, medevacs. So our mission sets would vary like extremely. Oftentimes we'd change numerous times within the same flight. So our services were in high demand. We stayed busy. You never really knew what it was going to be. You're just out there basically flying, looking, we used to call it looking for work boom, you get a medevac or, Hey, here's a convoy down here. Like, what are they doing? Where's their air support? Who are they? You know, we'd try and find out who they were. And then we'd just link up with them. Even if we didn't have comms with them, we'd just fly nice and low over their roofs and, you know, rock the rotor disc to let them know we were there. And a lot of times we wouldn't even establish radio comms. We'd just kind of start working for them. We we're always so close. Like we'd just go right to like vehicle rooftop level, could kind of communicate like with our hands, Hey, we're going to look up ahead, you know, that sort of thing. Do you think that's a function of the helicopter or is a helicopter a function of the mission? In other words, it's definitely a different aircraft as far as it's pretty small and agile. And I don't know if it's more difficult to see because of its size, but do you feel like the aircraft was chosen because of the mission or because you have this aircraft, it's able to do all these little sneaking around type of missions? And a way to answer that, like basically, like I remember back when I was going through flight school, I was trying to choose which aircraft to pick, you know, because I was kind of new to all this. And like mm-hmm. no one I knew like flew helicopters. And I remember there was a dude who told me, he was like, you know, pick the mission, not the aircraft. So, I mean, I think really the mission was there. And like the Kiowa was just like the absolute best suited to do all the things that I was just saying. Mm-hmm. You had such good visibility. I know we'll talk about the systems and things like that, but I mean, you know, we're sitting there hanging out. Like we never even installed the doors. Like we're hanging out with image stabilized binoculars and like all kinds of stuff. Like we were like right there. (laughs) Well, I guess that's the point of the observation style aircraft, right? Is you can go out and look at things either with the standard Mark one motto eyeball or later on, (laughs) they add the mast to the top. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, let's talk through the variants and we'll, we'll start at the beginning. I mean, first off, Teach me this. I think of this aircraft, I look at it, and what comes to my mind is a Bell Jet Ranger. Now, is that just a civilian version of it? And you talked about the two blades, so I assume is there a four blade version as well? Yeah. Maybe we can just start the beginning and work through this thing. Yeah, totally. I mean, like, you know, one of the earlier ones, it looks like a news chopper painted green. I mean, it's just, you know, it's that's exactly what it is. <laughs> People ask me, they'll be like, what'd you fly? I'm like, I flew the Kai. We're like, what's that? I'm like, just go look at chopper four, paint it green, put four blades on it. <laughs> you know, like, that's basically what it looked like. But yeah, I mean, it was, you know, it was the Bell 206 and then the 406, you know, that's really the one just a couple nice enhancements. It was still a single engine turbine Rolls Royce, but it had the four blades. Uh, the rotor system was, was a little fully articulated all this. So it just kind of mm-hmm. was upgraded, if you will. All right. So let's start at the beginning. You've got the OH 58 a, which also I guess was called the CH one thirty six in Canada. And so that's the two blade you were talking about. Kind of a little bit more simple. Yeah. To my knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. And then a couple of those got upgraded to C's. And then is the OH-58D, is that kind of the quintessential model? Yeah. So like, that's really the one I'm kind of referring to, you know, the D is where it was like, okay, this is the 406. This is the one with the four blades. You know, we put the site on top, we threw the weapon systems on there. And I mean, there were slight modifications like within the OH-58D, like there's like a D with then like brackets and I or like an R. So there's like little differences in there, but I mean, that was pretty easy to kind of you know, once you got in and I think I only flew one of the I models, maybe like once or twice when I very first got to the unit, cause they were being phased out, but it wasn't too much of a difference in the grand scheme of things. Okay. And then of course you have civilian variants of this aircraft. And then in the Navy, I believe this is the basis of our TH 57 sea Ranger. I think they call it the Creek or whatever. Yeah. So basically like that's what the TH 67 is actually what, when I went through flight school, what we trained in. I know the army got rid of those. I don't actually know exactly what they're using now, but that was kind of like when I was going through a flight school, that was your first solo, kind of your first everything with the helicopter was basically that variant. Yeah. The Navy and the Marine Corps helicopter training has been using the TH-57 forever. And I think they're about to finally replace it. And I suddenly can't remember the nomenclature of the new one, but okay. So this is pretty versatile. I read about 2,200 oh 58s made probably several thousand others of the siblings if you will and cousins 
And so what did you spend most of your career in? The Delta, I'm guessing? Yes, absolutely. They were called like the Alpha Chuck a lot of times. is like an A slash C, you know, the OH-58, A slash C. Um, mm-hmm. Those are, I think, you know, some like police departments or maybe, you know, like local agencies may still have a few of those knocking around. But that was not in the inventory when I was actually active duty. Pretty much all the squadrons, you know, were, were all just, if you had OH-58s, it was going to be the OH-58D. Okay. And how many hours did you end up with in those? I ended up with like 15, 50, I think it was. It was like close to a thousand. It was like, I was so close. It was like 985 or something combat hours. <laughs> but yeah, I know. Oh, I was just man. like, I'm just like, I'm hoping Bell will still give me the pin. You know, I'm like, come on, it's so close. Cause they had like a really cool pin to put on your stats. And if you had a thousand combat hours uh-huh. and I remember I was like leaving country, I was adding it all up. I was like, dude, I don't get my Bell feather. So (laughs) (laughs) you just needed a slightly larger pencil when you were logging. Yeah, apparently I know, I know integrity. I hate you. So 1500 roughly total hours of which two thirds were combat. Yeah. Sounds about right. (laughs) That's crazy. All right. And then I think, the U.S. Army is not the only flyer of this thing, right? Isn't it around a couple of different countries? Yeah. To my knowledge right now, you know, basically the Army got rid of it just in the last couple of years. I actually went out and watched the final flight in Savannah, which was kind of an emotional experience. I went down on uh, River Street in Savannah, and uh, I'd only been out, I don't know, not even a year And, uh, you know, our squadron, all the guys who were remaining, they took all the birds and they flew like this huge formation, just slow right over downtown, like arced over Tybee Island. It was really cool to watch when, you know, I watched our squadron shut down and that kind of was happening all around the country. Most of the Kiowas got just annihilated. (laughs) They basically just destroyed them or they put some of them in storage. So like some of our last ones were flown out to the desert. And then there were some that were given to allies. I believe I read it, you know, like Greece, Tunisia, Croatia, maybe Taiwan. There's a couple other countries on there, I'm sure, that still do fly them. And I know that they were putting out basically, hey, if you used to fly these or were an instructor, like a crew chief on them, you know, they're kind of contracting dudes out to come kind of pass the knowledge learned. Yeah, I read uh, Australia, Austria, Canada. I think you named a couple like Greece, uh, Turkey. So yeah, this thing's made its way around. And I read that they were talking about some follow-on variants with more letters, you know, E or F or whatever. But I'm curious, when they retired them out of the Army, what replaced them? Well, that was kind of the sore point. So we were sitting there. We kind of got the big bomb drop during one of our pilot's classes. You know, we're all in the little auditorium. And we knew the writing was on the wall. But then, you know, our squadron standardization pot came out. And he's like, okay, it's gone. It's going to go away. So that was kind of the official stamp, but uh, that was kind of the following question. So everybody's like, okay, well, what are we going to do? Because, I mean, originally the Comanche was going to be this like awesome army platform, stealth helicopter is going to do all this cool stuff, you know, but I think there's like two that were only ever built. They're like in a hangar in Fort Rucker somewhere. Right. So like that whole entire program got canceled. So that was going to be the replacement. And then while I was going through flight school, there was actually one of the other replacement ideas. It was called the ARH. That thing came and landed on the little parade field. So I got to look around it and um, that was going to be a replacement. But again, I believe, you know, contract over budget, all the fun things that happen with these sorts of things. So I think we ended up spending, you know, just billions on it. And then we gave it to like, I don't know, Iraq, I think, or something. (laughs) So (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we did a whole lot of R and D on a replacement to just kind of turn it over to somebody else. And, uh, now pretty much I was talking to one of the prior 58 guys and it's basically the Apache and a UAV are generally taking over what we used to do as best they can, you know, just kind of working in concert and hopefully, you know, we've got enough guys with the background that are still in, they're able to kind of school everybody up and try and turn the Apache into, you know, as as best a platform as it can be in that role. You know, sadly, just in my opinion, it's kind of a loss really for the ground guys because they just kind of lost that like really, really close in intimate aircraft that's like right there. I mean, the Apache is great. You know, UAVs are great. They all have great capabilities. It's just, you know, one was really good at doing that one thing and now it's gone. And we're going to talk about the Apache next week as the final episode of Army Aviation Month. But my guess is just without even knowing too much about it is 
maybe there's not enough of those or they're going to be busy doing other things. And a UAV can't just pull up on top of a convoy it's never seen before and slow down <laughs> right. and start doing hand signals, right? So yeah. I feel like we're losing some capability here. It's funny because I think guys were burned up because they were you know, basically being forced out of the Army because the Army really, they got rid of the aircraft, but they also got rid of the pilots. So you had dudes who you know had two and three deployments in and maybe they were at 12 or 15 years oh. and they wanted to do their 20. But it was like, well, your aircraft's going away and we don't have a slot for you and one of the other three. So you got to find something else to do in a quick hurry. It basically became this like shotgun blast, every man for himself. It was horrible. So, you know, you had some guys who calling in every dang favor they had, you know, okay, they secured a spot, you know, over here in this black Hawk, or maybe this guy got in with the Apaches over here. You know, some guys ended up, you know, the one sixtieth or who knows what, I mean, everybody just scattered that you still have, you know, quite a few dudes who like really actually wanted to pursue aviation, but they just weren't able to. So the aircraft was lost. And then all those aviators that had that experience and all that were also lost with it. Well, that makes sense. I mean, even I think you said it was your dad who was an A6 guy. When the A6 went away, you had all the bombardier navigators who suddenly were unemployed because when the Hornet came along, you had a handful of two-seaters in the Marine Corps, but otherwise they were single seat. And then same thing for the F-14. So uh, in my world, it's the Naval Flight Officer that's usually the one kind of left without a seat when the music stops because all these aircraft, including the F-35, are all going to single seats. So right. Sounds like the same thing for you guys. All of a sudden, it helped to have a sugar daddy, I guess, for people, <laughs> right? It's like, hey, I, you know, give me a job. And uh, if you're lucky, you find one. And interestingly enough, the Kiowa, you could fly a single pilot. It was rated for it. We never did it around just a very, very, very limited bit, you know, like maintenance test flights. If it was just like a pretty senior maintenance dude doing something simple, he might get blessed off on it. It just kind of depended on like how risk averse that command was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So not really sure where I'm going with that, but yeah, basically it was just, it was two, you know, it was a crew <laughs> of two. So it's like, you know, and we, and we just, yeah. and it was totally, what do you want to do today? Like even downrange, You might not even know really until that morning, like we'd fill out the paperwork the night before, but sometimes things would come down or we'd shift it around, but we were pretty tight knit, you know, and, and as warrant officers, it's just kind of like, Hey Bob, what's up, Joe? So, you know, my buddy look at me and be like, all right, Ryan, what do you want to do? I'd be like, I've been flying like crazy last four days. I want to sit in the left seat, you know? So we would just kind of choose like, what do you want to do today? Do you want to fly or do you want to run the radios and the mission and the weapon system where, and it's funny because actually like the left seat could be so much more busy than the right seat. Cause you just had so much more going on in that seat, trying to control the battle and figure out what's going on. And you had five radios going on. You're over there with maps and knee boards and your buddies over there just flying, laughing at you, you know, it looks yeah. busy over there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a different kind of busy, right? Yeah. Because the flying can be busy if you're trying to get into a hot LZ perhaps, or trees are close by, or if you're snooping around close to the trees kind of thing. right? Yeah. And I mean, it's funny because the aircraft, like, you had to be good at flying it. You just didn't have a choice because there's so much that we were responsible for doing. You really didn't have a choice to suck. Like you needed to be good at what you did because, you know, we're going to be down low. We're going to be zipping around, but there's dudes depending on you. You like, you can't really afford to not be good at this. So like we really tried to develop those tactics and procedures, especially with our you know newer aviators and try and just build them up as quick as we could. Cause we just couldn't afford that much on the job training. So the aircraft just kind of became an extension of yourself. It was really, it's kind of a Zen way to describe it, but it was, you know, you just basically like, I'm at this point in the sky and I need to be over there like right now, because this is going down and my left seater needs this. So you're always trying to get it to the position where that left seater can really, he can see what he needs to see. He's talking to who he needs to talk to. So the whole time you were just trying to protect your wingman. If you were like in lead or trail, that also depended on on how you operated because the guy in lead was going to be really the low, really racing around guy. And then trail, you know, wingman's back there basically covering his tail. They're talking a little bit more to hire, but that right seer and that trail bird is just fixated on his wingman just to make sure anything that happens to him, you're there to avenge it. <laughs> you know, like you're there to protect them Yeah, because they're down there protecting the ground guy, not <laughs> themselves, you know, so that's kind of how we operate well, and being low and relatively slow by my standards, you are exposed to a lot of threats, aren't you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's what's so funny. You know, there was always this 
I don't know really how to say it. You know, you basically would have people who didn't quite understand like what we were doing or like what our purpose really was. So they might just see like, okay, look at these calf guys, with their Stetsons and they're down there zipping around the trees being cowboys. And it's like, no, actually the reason I was at like a hundred feet is because it's a lot harder for the enemy with his AK to hit me because I'm all of a sudden coming from one end of his compound to the other so fast, right overhead. He has no idea where he's came from and he can't get a beat on me. But if I'm at like 500 or a thousand feet, Mm -hmm. he's got time. Okay. There he is. He can set up a good shot. And getting back to the single pilot thing, was there ever a situation or practice or policy regarding perhaps the ground commander just needed to get a better view of something? So he would jump in and go take a look around. I never saw it personally. I mean, I've heard of something similar that must be kind of a past experience thing. I never personally witnessed it, at least in my squadron. I mean, I was fortunate really to stay in 317, like my whole like six years out of flight school until I got out of the army. Like I just stayed in Savannah. So my experience is, is unfortunately kind of pigeonholed to that one area. So I never really got to see like how other squadrons do it. Cause you know, there's a standard, but then there's also like each squadron kind of had its own whatever. So, I mean, I can imagine that would happen, yeah. but I just never personally saw it. All right. So if you're down low and trying to stay even lower, so you're not getting shot at, the good news is you can shoot back, right? So let's talk armament in two parts and we'll start with the aircraft itself. What was a typical loadout or what kinds of things could it carry? So it basically had three primary weapon systems. The configuration loadout kind of depended on what you needed to do, like accomplish for an assigned mission, or just at least what you expected that day or night to happen. Uh, the most common weapon combo was pretty much the M3P 50 cal machine gun, which was on the left that had a max magazine about is 500 rounds. And then you'd have like maybe another 50 in the shoot or so. And of course that loadout would be predicated by weight and balance and things like that. But that M3P machine gun, that thing came off of like this Avenger anti-aircraft setup or something. So like I had never experienced those really until right before we deployed. Cause we had the old school, like Ma Deuce. that M3P shot so much faster. <laughs> the thing was like 1150 or something rounds per minute, like the whole entire aircraft. The first time I remember coming in, you know, cause we sat in the right seat. So the right seat is the one on the trigger and I did a diving fire. And when I pushed that weapon fire switch, that whole freaking aircraft yawed so hard. Like I just had to mash that left pedal. Was, oh my God. And the guy over there in the left seat knew it was coming. He's been doing this to everybody. So he's just laughing at me. And I just watched my rounds just pepper left. And he's like, you better fix it. And I was like, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> so that was the M3P. It was pretty sweet. <laughs> that thing was pretty sweet. And then, so we'd have that on the left. And then on the right side, we'd have a seven shot hydro rocket pod. So that's kind of the same, like 2.75 inch rockets we've been using forever. And there are several rocket types available. Mm -hmm. You know, you have the 10 pound rockets. What I would generally use would be like 10 pound rockets. We also had flechettes, which were basically a shotgun round and a rocket is the best way to describe it. It would actually detonate the little, it would spread open the warhead, if you will. And it would put out a cone of these little like dart size nails they were like 55 grains. So basically like the same size as like a five, five, six round, but there was 1,170 of them, I think. So it just put out like over a thousand rounds of ammunition at once. It was insane. Um, or we also had like red phosphorus and that was for generally marking stuff and all that it just makes a big red cloud. Yeah. There was other kind of stuff too. Like there's IR illumination rockets, you know, everything's pitch black outside. We're wearing, you know, night vision goggles, but the infrared spectrum is what we use. So, you know, we'd pop an IR rocket and that thing would float down a parachute and it's like like an artillery parachute flare, you know, it just kind of lights up everything. So we could use those as well. It's kind of generally what, what I generally rolled with there as far as rockets are concerned. And then occasionally we would ditch the machine gun and we could actually carry two rocket pods. So you'd have seven times two. So you'd have 14 rockets and we called the rocket rocket birds. We called them the crowd pleaser. Cause it was just like a lot of rockets and made a lot of noise. <laughs> so, you know, just like, Oh, I'm in a, I'm in a yeah. crowd pleaser today. Okay. You know, 
Well, it depends on which crowd you're yeah, in. Yeah, exactly. It's the American uh, good guy crowd, right? And it's so funny because, like, from the cockpit, it just kind of makes this, like, whooshing thud sound. It's really kind of anticlimactic. It's not really anything to write home about. But from the ground, the thing sounds wicked. Like, the thing's nuts sounding. Oh, I bet. So, like, anytime we'd be doing gunnery, I yeah. mean, that thing echoes. It sounds so vicious. It's just so funny because then when you're up in the cockpit, you're like, oh, that doesn't sound like that at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's all relative. Exactly. And then, you know, another combination, you know, you could either ditch your machine gun or ditch a rocket pod and put on a Hellfire launcher. So then you could run the different models of Hellfires depending on, you know, what was going on. There's different variants of Hellfires. I'm sure the Apache guys will talk more about that because they used them much more than we did. I've seen pictures where you could do Hellfire, Hellfire, but you were pretty much kind of limited by weight and balance. And it's just a lot of weight and armament on a helicopter that doesn't really like to carry that much. With the uh, 50 caliber gun, when that's firing, you talked earlier about not having doors on the thing. Is that pretty loud? I mean, of course, you're wearing, I'm guessing, foamies in your helmet. But what's that like when you're, apart from trying to aim the thing like you expressed, what's it like just for the sound? For the right seater, it's fine. For the left seater, he is sitting by the muzzle and in front of the muzzle. So, like, that thing was literally down just a few feet to your left and slightly behind you. So you're just rattling the teeth in your skull with every shot. And that thing is just going. So your buddy's over there just shaking while you're going in on engagement, just wondering when you're going to release the trigger. (laughs) Yeah. Just sitting, waiting. Oh gosh. And as far as armament too, one thing that people don't really consider to think about, you know, we also kind of a secondary weapon system we had was just on a mount right in the aircraft's dash, like each one of our M4s basically our rifles, like we trained and practiced for engaging targets, you know, at close range with the rifles, whenever an opportunity presented itself, because sometimes like an engagement posed the least risk of collateral damage and a greatest chance of neutralizing a threat just by using the rifle. Cause I mean, you're not spraying all over the place. It's not a high explosive, you know, it's a much more uh, precise weapon, if you will. So everyone kind of highly modified yeah. and individualized their gear and ammo load out and you know, each pilot decided what weapon site even worked best for them. Cause I mean, you're sitting there, you know, strapped in with a five point harness and hanging out this open door, but you're kind of limited on how much you can really move and like shoulder that thing. So some people like the little aim point red dots, some guys were like old school. I'm just using iron sights. And, you know, some guys use the, the ACOG, which I actually preferred. I mean, it had magnification, but if you shot with both eyes open, you could still get around it. It kind of worked as a red dot. But my whole thought process was if I end up on the ground when I wasn't expecting it and I'm trying to take a walk out, I'd kind of like to have a little bit more magnification, you know, on my weapon considering the train and the, the area we we're fighting in. Well, and that was the second part of my question. And as we'll get to at the end, I have some listener questions for you. And one of them is from someone with the name Dyslexi. And it was said, how common was it to use personal weapons and equipment during a mission, including hand-thrown smokes or grenade launch munitions or personal weapons such as rifles? So not only common, but trained and endorsed. Yeah, like. absolutely. I mean, it was in our gunnery manual. If we were doing a gunnery, sometimes, especially uh, later on in my time in the squadron, you know, that started to get more harped on. Some of the training and some of the poo-pooing against it was just because the occasional helicopter skid would catch a round or two of ours. <laughs> so oh. <laughs> it, was, it was more of a risk averse thing and like an equipment repair issue than yeah. it was like, we don't want our, so it's kind of funny because like we wanted guys to be really good at doing it when they needed to do it. But then we were really like hesitant to really put a rifle in there and give them a bunch of rounds and say, try it out. Cause please don't shoot the helicopter. And that was always kind of the joke. Like if you're pulling your M4 <laughs> off, it's like, please do not shoot us. <laughs> I could see a crew chief uh, welcoming the pilot back to take care of that for him since he was the one who did it. But I would think more important than the skids are the blades, the rotor disc, but maybe that wasn't as big. Yeah. That's that's high enough up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what attitude you'd be in there. (laughs) Uh, Maybe a hard bank is the only thing I can think of now. Obviously, you're not employing your personal weapon if you're the one flying, because I've never flown a helicopter, but as I understand it, you're kind of using every limb, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and you can't let go of it. Like now I fly airplanes, you know, and it's it's nice and lazy and easy, but not with the Kiowa. Like it's, I mean, your feet always on the pedals, like your left hand's always on that collective, right hand's always on the cyclic because you never really knew it was going to happen and you just couldn't let go of the controls. It was just that simple. 
there was one instance where I was with a pretty new guy and flying around and training and he wasn't thinking or he kind of let his feet off the pedals for a second. And that was a very fast and scary ride <laughs> to get it back under control. You know, it's kind of one of those like, oh. so just remember to always keep your feet on the pedals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That uh, important safety tip, right? Tell me about aiming because we've I've talked about on the show before, like grease pencil marks on windshields and all the way up to helmet mounted sights and different things. What did you guys have in the Kiowa? We, my first deployment, I'd heard that people use grease pencils, but no one in my troop really did. We just generally used just wherever they're hitting on the windscreen is where you're going to hit today. Really? So whenever we'd go out on a mission, we would go out to our test fire area and you'd go ahead and let a little burst of 50 cal go, let a rocket or two go, just making sure, okay, the 50 cal is working as advertised today. The rocket pod's hitting where I expect it to, but you know, that would kind of give you an idea for that aircraft and where your butt was and for the rest of the day, kind of like where your rounds are going to hit. So you basically just knew just with experience that they were on in the windscreen. That's generally where it's going to go. I mean, come on, this is 2020. I I know. I still, this cracks me. I know. And then later on, you know, when I was in Kandahar on my second deployment, you know, there was a lot more move and a lot more people who you know, were like, no, 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 we definitely we need to use grease pencils, you know? Okay. But I mean, you still kind of did the exact same thing. You'd go in on an engagement, you'd fire and you'd say, okay, transfer the controls. And then you'd reach up with your grease pencil and put a little X where they hit. And then you'd come back around and you'd go ahead and do another engagement. And then you'd find out if your grease pencil mark was correct or not. So, so you'd be like, oh, hold on here, take the controls. I need to erase that one, you know, and you kind of scrape it off and yeah, here about two inches more this way. That looks right. <laughs> well, was it safe to say that, I don't want to say precision wasn't important, but I don't know how else to ask it. I mean, you guys weren't shooting super long range, like a, a deer on the next ridge top with a high powered rifle. Are you getting kind of up close and uh, personal with this weapon? It was a lot more close. I mean, you know, there were some pretty skilled shooters, I mean, like in anything. So, I mean, we had guys that, I mean, Mm -hmm. they would just use the force and put a rocket kilometers away. You're like, dude, what? There's no sight. Like you just (laughs) literally volleyed that thing and it worked. It was impressive. There was definitely a a select few that like, if it was going to be a long shot, I'd be like, cool. I'm glad he's doing it today. That's just being honest. But yeah, I mean, a lot of times it was, yeah, it was a little bit closer up, you know, and it'd be diving fire engagements or different, you know, we had all kinds of different ways we'd go about it, but generally you'd just be more or less diving in towards the target and uh, just breaking off. So it'd get pretty close. Yeah. Let's talk performance. What did you typically fly around at? How high have you ever had one of these? So it's not excessively fast, but I mean, it's definitely like a sports car and because it's just small and like extremely maneuverable, mm-hmm. our max speed depended on whether or not you did have the doors on. But in our community, you just didn't put the doors on. Like everyone would make fun of you. <laughs> like, <laughs> what's wrong with you? Why would you have the doors on? And even like, if it was going to be rainy out, like rain wouldn't actually get it in as much as you think, just so long as you're in coordinated forward flight, like you're not really going to get wet. But then of course, when you like landed at the fart then you're going to get soaked. And even like on a cold day, you'd, re- you'd rethink your life decisions, not having the doors on. Cause you're like up in the Hindu Kush mountains, you know, like 9,000 plus feet freezing, but then it had a pretty good heater and no one just ever wanted to admit that they were cold and they wish they had the doors on. Like, no one would say it. They'd just be like, ow, I'm cold. <laughs> <laughs> Pride is a terrible thing. Nobody wants to be laughing. Yeah, yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's like, I remember we did it once and I even have photos. And even to this day, like I see this one picture of us flying. I mean, it's, it looks reasonable to an outsider. Like we're in this insanely snow covered frosty mountain pass. And I have a picture of my wingman and he's got doors on. And I look at that picture. And I'm like, whatever. What'd you have doors on for? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. If we're not a little bit suffering, we haven't done our jobs, but yeah. uh, all right. So with doors, can you get over a hundred or, I mean, I have no idea. What yeah. So be. basically, yeah, you would get, you know, an extra 10 or 20 knots when you had your doors on that was, it would increase your max speed a little bit, but yeah, it was just over a hundred knots with the doors off. Okay. So you guys probably spent most of your time, what, around 60 or 80? Yeah. Cause I mean, it didn't have a huge, you know, fuel tank by any means. Like it didn't really have the legs to stay on station forever. So like, if you were just always, you know, yanking and banking and flying that thing, like you stole it, you're not going to have as much time to support the guys. So yeah, you basically, 
you would figure out through experience and time. And I can't remember the exact figure, but you'd be like, okay, as long as I'm sitting about this power setting and this airspeed, I'm going to burn roughly this amount of fuel. And like, that's the happy place. Like that's unless something goes crazy, like let's right. try and stay there. So speed was somewhat insignificant at that point. Yeah. Pretty much everybody was faster than us. I think actually, <laughs> I can't think we were the slowest. <laughs> How high up have you flown one? The funny thing is, I remember arguing about this. I don't recall ever being told what the actual proper service ceiling was. We ended up on one mission around Bagram. I know that I was at just over 13,000 feet and it did not like it. <laughs> so <laughs> I was with a maintenance test pilot, luckily. We kind of both looked at each other. I was like, I think we just found out what our service ceiling might be. <laughs> it does not like this at all. I never really took it any higher than that. And it was, you know, there are a couple of guys that kind of joke, like, see who's gone the highest. But uh, I don't even know. I mean, there might be somebody out there that's like, whatever, I took mine to 15 and all the power to you. But I mean, I wasn't feeling good at 13. We also didn't have oxygen. And I mean, we were used to operating at higher right. altitudes, but still, I mean, in a stressful situation, like way high up in the mountains, trying to look for bad guys doing this, doing that. There's wind. You're also oxygen starved. So it wasn't the greatest mm -hmm. feeling in the world. Well, when you rely on beating air into submission to fly, if there's not a lot of air, yeah, exactly. you're not going to fly too well. So obviously the higher you go, this is most obvious statement of the day, but the higher you go, the less air there is. And so the less lift. Correct. So. What was a typical on station? Like what's in your log books, a bunch of one hour flights or two hour flights or. Yeah. We would call it generally like a bag of gas. So like a bag of gas for us was going to be roughly two hours, give or take okay. a bit, just because again, you know, we kind of had to be masters of weight and balance. So it was like, is your sole purpose today? Like a troops in contact. So and how bad is it? Like, how concerned are we with having more ammo versus more fuel? Like, do we just need to be there or do we need to be there fighting? And so that could kind of dictate yeah. like how long your station time is going to be. Because I still remember a hundred rounds of 50 cal weighs 33 pounds. That would actually become a significant sum. <laughs> That's kind of how we would have to really gauge it and be like, okay, you know, how long can we play today? So my logbook kind of varies wildly because yeah. I would just, you know, you'd log it as a day or a night shift, you know? So, I mean, some of them are like 7.5 or eight or something like that. And then some of them are like two. It just kind of depends on what was going down. So if you stop somewhere at a FARP, as you called it earlier, which is a, what, a fuel and arming? Fuel and rearm point. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So you just stop there and hot gas. If you stop and all you do is just get gas and just keep going. That's just all one giant flight basically. Oh yeah. Cause you wouldn't shut down. It was a hot gas. I mean, it was, it was like a NASCAR pit okay. crew. Like, and, and I mean, I'm not yeah. even kidding. Like, especially if things were really going down, you're calling to that farp a couple minutes out, just, Hey, we need this much. We need this much gas. We need this much ammo. Like we got to go troops in contact. I mean, those dudes would pour out. Those fart crews were awesome because they would just run out there. Like the rotor's still turning hundred percent. One of the pilots is probably jumping out to help them. You know, a lot of times we would even load rockets with them because we're just trying to get wow. back out there as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. I never saw a cow pilot cast themselves, but I certainly saw we would load ourselves. <laughs> so the point you're making, which if you don't mind me summarizing for you, is it's not about you guys. It's about the guys and gals on the ground. Yeah. Fiercely, fiercely loyal to the guys on the ground. And I think that's kind of going back to what we are saying about what has been lost when the Kiowa is gone. Not that any of the other assets mm -hmm. aren't fiercely loyal to the ground guys, but like we were just so up close and personal with them. We were reliable to be on station for as long as we could be. And we would go through you know, like a pit crew to get back there. And we would just do it as long as we had to until they were safe. Like that's all we cared about. Yeah. No, that's cool. I just like that people say that on this show because I feel like military aviators, specifically fighter pilots in general, get such a bad rap for being so full of themselves. And I think we can thank Maverick and Iceman <laughs> and all the Top Gun characters. But but more often than not, guests come on the show and they say, you know, I'm an extension of those folks. We're serving them. We're supporting them. And I just think that's awesome because it, it really takes the spotlight off of us. And it says it's a team effort. It requires all of us. And in this particular case, I'm supporting someone else and I'll do what it takes. And that was the key motivator, even for me choosing the Kiowa back in flight school is because when I understood the mission and I was actually on the phone talking to my brother about it the night before, because, you know, he had been down in Otomia in Iraq and I was like, Hey, you know, 
did you guys deal with assets? Like, what did you do with Army Helos? And then he told me about the Kiowa and the multiple times that a Kiowa had saved his platoon and helped out his guys. I mean, he just talked about the Kiowa, like with just such reverence and just like such awe about how awesome that thing was and how many times that they really honestly were saved by one. And so it just made my decision crystal clear. I was like, well, that's it. That's exactly what I want to do. That's cool. It sounds like you and your brother are pretty close. Yeah, he went through a lot. I mean, his time in Automia was, you know, he was there for a while. There was just daily firefights with that guy. It's crazy to me, like how the, you know, the OIF guys, like those early Iraq deployment dudes, when I really get a beer in them and talk to them, you know, they're just like, dude, you were in a firefight like more often Mm -hmm. than you weren't. (laughs) It's insane. You were just constantly in firefights, weren't you? (laughs) Yeah, there was always something going on. (laughs) Yeah. Thank God for people like him, because I feel like a giant wuss at times to think, man, I don't want that. (laughs) That's why I went to naval aviation. So I didn't have to get involved in that day-to-day, hand-to-hand type of stuff. So I'm I'm so glad that there are people willing to do that. Mm -hmm. What was the Kiowa like to fly? And of course, this is probably going to fall on deaf ears because I've never flown a helicopter. But just as far as helicopters go, you said earlier you couldn't take your hands and feet off of anything. But was it a joy to fly in general or was it a lot of work? Was it fatiguing? Uh, Was it good fly-by whatever flight controls? I mean, what was it like to actually pilot the thing? Absolutely the coolest thing I've ever flown. You have to pay attention to it, but then at the same time, you just got such a good feel for it that you could really, really anticipate what's going to be going on with that thing. And you could put it almost anywhere. As long as like the little tiny LZ you chose or what, you know, the weather or whatever cooperates, like you could get it virtually anywhere. It was an absolute joy to fly around. It was highly maneuverable. It was just, it was a sports car. It was just an absolute joy. Yeah. Uh, you know, now I'm flying big Airbus and I mean, that thing's, yeah. <laughs> it's not really that fun at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they reward you for it handsomely. So, uh, but don't tell anybody that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we're up to the point where we'll talk strengths and weaknesses. And this is always relative because, of course, the thing wasn't designed to do everything, right? Right. I think you just talked about the agility. It uh, feels probably like a personal aircraft that you strap to you and wherever you want to go, it goes kind of thing. Pretty much. Any other strengths as far as that goes? Kind of like we've talked about, really. You know, it's, it's just excellent close range uh, surveillance and mobility, just being able to go anywhere. The strength, I think, really was more for what it provided the ground force or what it provided the medevac coming into an LZ, you know, in the army, we call it the whoopee, like the poncho liner blanket, you know, we were their whoopee, you know, we're always like the comfort blanket. We would show up and like, you know, it's like, okay, the Kiowas are here. Like it's going to make it a little bit harder on the enemy to make trouble for us today. And so like, I think the biggest like strength wasn't the aircraft maybe itself, but just, in that mission and in that role and how it was utilized. I think it's kind of not really the best answer to like, how does this aircraft work question? But like, I would still say that, you know, we just went such a long way to make sure that we were protecting those guys. And I think that's what the strength really was, was that, you know, if there was a troops in contact, if there was something critically going down, like when we operated the quick reaction force mission, I mean, we would be inside board watching, you know, a movie or something. And if that call came through, I mean, we would be in the air in record time. That was the biggest strength is that we would have that thing so ready to go. We would have gone out there. We pre-flighted, we had all our gear, night vision goggles, everything set up ready. So that the second a call came, that was the strength is like, they knew that we were not going to be very far away. Yeah. And that's obviously a capability that is hard to duplicate it has to do with the aircraft, but also proximity and coordination right. and all that. Sounds like the Kiowa is pretty widely loved by its pilots, if you're an indication of that. But was there ever anything that you thought, man, I wish they would just fix this? Maybe something that was a either a glitch in the cockpit or something about its <laughs> engine or systems or anything else? What, what bugged you about it? Let's put it that way. For it being a single Rolls-Royce engine, it was a good engine, but it, when you lost that one engine, that's all you had. <laughs> so, like, I kind of wish it would have had two, you know, uh, like everybody else has two. But then you would have been heavier. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. But that's what that ARH was supposed to address. You know, that ARH that was supposed to replace it was going to be a, mm-hmm. a you know, dual end. Well, it is. Somebody else has it. We don't. But <laughs> it's probably they're enjoying it right now that it has two engines. It definitely 
it did suffer from, you know, weight and balance and performance issues like any aircraft, like high, hot environments, you know, sure. it's just like a summer in the middle East is just horrible on anything, but especially that because, you know, the aircraft was only 5,200 pounds, like max gross weight. I mean, when you start talking about throwing rockets wow. on there and two people with all their gear and, you know, 50 cal rounds and gas, whatever. I mean, it just, that was probably one of the bigger weaknesses was that, you really needed to have your game together because you might only have a couple percent of power to work with before you're going to be exceeding limitations and starting to break stuff. Yeah, that's crazy. I guess it's worth mentioning. We probably should have done it at the beginning, but this helicopter is not like a Huey that people might picture where you have a, I don't know what to call it, but a cabin with doors where you can carry troops and you've got door gunners and all that. I mean, it's basically the two of you and that's it. That's right. The back where a seat like used to be, you know, the older variants and, you know, chopper four and all that kind of stuff, the, the original bell 206 style, you know, that has a back seat. You're sitting on a fuel cell back there, but you did have a back seat mm -hmm. and the OH 58 D it was just all black boxes back there. It was just avionics, electronics, you name it. It was just computers back there. Yeah. And then with the doors off, but even regularly, I'm reading Robert Mason's Chicken Hawk book right now again, uh, The book. Helicopter War in Vietnam. And he talks about, uh, it's a great book, but he, he talks about complaining about lack of chest armor and the occasional very unlucky person who took a round coming into an LZ or going out. Was that a weakness? I mean, when you had the doors off, did you feel exposed or were you exposed? Did you ever know of anyone who was shot, basically? We did have that, but I mean, the doors were not bullet stoppers. <laughs> I mean, it was just very thin okay. skin. Like, yeah, it's not like the movies where you see like, you know, these like big sparky ricochets where like the AK rounds bounce off. Like, no, they are going right. right through that thing. They're not stopping anywhere. So there was very, very, very light armor. We had an armored side panel, which basically was like not even a half door. I'd say like a third door. And so it was basically when you were sitting in the seat, this thing would cover up just below your shoulder, like to your thigh. It was kind of meant to like from a direct side shot, like stop around. That was good for, you know, light, light fire, like AK 47 rounds, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And then you were sitting on a little armored plate. And then I believe, you know, there's a little bit of armor throughout the helicopter for very critical areas, but not much. Because again, we were kind of weight limited. Once we started strapping armor on there, then the thing just was too much of a dog to even fly. Did you guys wear anything particular, chest protectors or anything else? We wore, um, you know, this air warrior vest is, it's basically just a, like a light body armor. So, you know, you see like the infantry guys out there, all the pictures, you know, and, and they've got the IOTV and it's, you know, a front plate and a back plate and these side plates and things like that. We basically, everybody rolled with just a front plate. Uh -huh. So, I mean, there were some guys probably that wore the back plate, but I don't know any personally. I never did. Okay. So you basically just had the one like front plate on your body armor and everybody ran their stuff pretty slick. There were even guys, you know, who bought stuff off the shelf on there. They just didn't like what we were issued. So they just went out and bought their own. So we had a lot of that going on, you know, and, and I was actually, you know, became the squadron Alsi guys. So I was not bothered by it in my mind. I was like, you know what? Who cares if that's what that dude's comfortable flying in? And like, obviously, as long as it's not just made in Timbuktu crap, like as long as it's just of good manufacture and, and it has armor, then right. like, let him use it. LC is what? Aviation life support equipment? Yeah. All right. So let's move on to notoriety. Now, a lot of aircraft, I mean, again, the F-14 is a no brainer with Top Gun. Other aircraft get various cameos and movies in different places. Apart from your news <laughs> <laughs> equivalents, like flying around in News Chopper 4 or whatever. Everybody's going to be so mad. All the prior Kiowa pilots listening to this right now are just yelling at their computer like, you, oh, son of a... But, I mean... <laughs> I went there. I'm sorry. It's not too late. We can still edit this out. All right. Well, with all apologies <laughs> to all the Kiowa pilots out there, let me, let's do this over. Where would the listener <laughs> have seen or heard of the OH-58? Because, again, there are variants out there doing other things, but did you guys make it in a transformers like every other military airplane? It's so little known. So, I mean, really like the movie firebirds, please don't watch it. <laughs> like it was the yeah. army's attempt, you know, like Tommy Lee and like Nicholas cage <laughs> tried to make top gun for the army and it was just really bad. And it was more Apache centric, but there was a Kiowa in it. 
but it was all wrong. Like it was a slick bird. It didn't have any armament, but it did have the mass mounted sight on top. It was just odd looking and like the whole thing was terrible. So, I mean, that's not the place to really go to find out about a Kiowa <laughs> to watch that maybe. <laughs> what, what used to inspire us at least, and it wasn't even a Kiowa, but it was just the mission. Like when I was in flight school, we loved Apocalypse Now, like that beach scene where, you know, where they're playing the music and like, they're like playing in the beach assault and they start playing the trumpet, oh, yeah. you know, dudes are wearing the stets and like, that still gives me chills just thinking about it. Cause like whenever like it got hard and you know, you had big tests coming up, like the stress levels just out the roof, we'd just be sitting there in that stupid Delville trailer park. <laughs> and I'd just be like, anybody want to watch Apocalypse Now? You know, <laughs> and like, we'd just turn it on and it's just that guy <laughs> playing that trumpet and the helicopter's taken off. And it's just like that's the air cav though, you know? So like not necessarily the Kiowa, but just the air cav. Like I've yeah. always just loved that. You know, it's just so iconic. Like when I got my Stetson, I was so thrilled. Like when I graduated flight school and like got to my unit and got my Stetson, like that was like the coolest trophy yeah. I could have ever gotten. So, but yeah, it's not like the Apache or the Blackhawk. It doesn't really show up in movies and yeah. pop, you know, any kind of culture. The only guys who really knew who we were, or what we did were like those we supported pretty much like out in combat roles. Amber Smith wrote a book called Danger Close, and it was Kiowa centric. She's kind of about her time, and I mean, it's it's a good read. And there's also a book right now that I'm reading. It's a fiction, but it's written by a prior SEAL named Jack Carr, and it's called Terminal List. And he's got a couple books coming out now. One of the characters in it is a prior Kiowa pilot that he rescued, and like, so it's kind of mentioned in there. So I mean, I'll find it like little tiny smatterings i'll find it mentioned here and there but it's always just like in that vein it's always like yeah. some ranger or some infantry or like oda seal something that kind of like mentions it offhand but nobody ever really knows what they're talking about <laughs> okay so it's always a supporting actor it's never the star of the show not very often no okay well, so for example, was it there in Somalia in what it was at 93? Because Black Hawk Down, the movie, shows, of course, the Black Hawks and then the Little Birds, I guess they are. I don't know, OH6 or something like that. But were you guys there? Yeah, like the 160th ran those. Okay. I don't actually know. I mean, that was a little bit before my time. I, basically, to my knowledge, that whole entire thing was basically okay. the 160th. They may have had another conventional army unit with them, but I don't know that the 160th you know, spec ops aviation regiment. I don't think that they've ever had Kiowas on their staff. They use the wizards. Gotcha. All right. Well, I'm sure our listeners will, as they often do pipe in here and correct me or add to this. So that's good stuff. Oh, I'm sure they'll correct me all day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that is the danger of sticking your neck out on these shows is you get to hear from, from your old buddies. who are going to tell you how wrong you got it, but no, you're doing great. I appreciate it. Uh, right. <laughs> when you look back at your 1500 hours in this thing, is there one particular flight that really stands out in your mind, either something crazy that happened or an emergency or you know, contact or tell us a good sea story if you've got one? Yeah. Um, well, first, you know, and I was thinking while we've been talking, I was sitting there thinking, I was like, yeah, that's probably like to include my TH-67 time. So it's probably more like in the actual Kiowa. It's probably more in the 1200 okay. to 1250 range, just to be clear. But yeah. You know, there's all kinds of missions, there's all kinds of stuff, but this one, I don't know why this one just kind of sticks out. I was actually one of my very first flights in Kandahar. So I'd done the whole year in Bagram. I'd been home for two years and then we redeployed again. This time we went to Kandahar. So I was with Charlie Troop. Like we do every time, you know, the outgoing unit kind of brings your guys up and gets you spooled up around the area and transfer the information, let everybody get a feel for what's going on, get you back in the saddle sort of thing. So I was with one of their pilots from the outgoing unit and we were out, he was showing me around my head's on a swivel. You know, I, I haven't been to Afghanistan in two years, so I'm just kind of getting my senses back. We got a call and this ground unit had started taking fire. They were trying to locate this shooter. So he's taking a couple pot shots at him and he's hiding. We ended up finding where this guy was shooting from. And sure enough, we saw a dude sprint out of the back of a building. He goes, jumps on a motorcycle, starts hauling down the highway. We're like, okay, we got you. But, you know, we're trying to get a description. We're trying to make sure, like, is this the guy? Because the rules of engagement had just gotten right. so tight. Like, this is late 2012, early 2013 at this point. And, I mean, the rules of engagement, we already had one hand tied behind our back, and they were grabbing the other. I mean, it was just, it was getting bad. So, we're just like, you know, can we be sure? Like, obviously, we know in our mind that, yes, this is the guy, but we have to prove it, you know? So, we're like, trying to work this up. So, meanwhile, 
He stops. Another dude jumps on the motorcycle. They just keep going. So these ground guys are like, that was him. I promise that was him. So we start trying to talk to somebody up the road because it's like, well, how are we going to stop these guys? They got on a motorcycle. Like they're like in a high speed chase with a helicopter behind them going down the highway. This is like a movie. So we are literally flying just above this dude and just behind him, like in this high speed helicopter motorcycle chase, like trying to get anybody on the radio to jump out in the road and stop this guy because right. we can't. <laughs> So we ended up like, I tried to hit him with a smoke grenade. <laughs> like we were popping flares. <laughs> like We're doing everything we can to just make this guy crash. <laughs> That's messed up. <laughs> There's like nothing else yeah. we could do. Yeah. We ended up finally, but we knew, mm-hmm. we just, we knew, you know, we knew this, this guy, this is the guy who's just mm-hmm. shooting at our people, you know? So sure enough, you know, we got a hold of some guys up the road and it was awesome because immediately these dudes, they realize what's happening. Like there's a motorcycle like, speeding right towards your checkpoint. So they just fly into the compound, the doors open and all these dudes just half wearing their battle stuff. You know, they're probably having lunch or something. And they just draw down in the middle of the road and stop this motorcycle like right before it flew by their gate. Cool. It was awesome. And they grab the guys, you know, and they're looking up at us and we didn't have radio comms with the guys who are actually like standing there with these two individuals who I believe were bad. So I'm trying to like motion like, okay, well, how do I tell this guy that these dudes, you know, need to be detained? Like I don't have a radio or anything. So I'm like trying to do sign language in this helicopter, like flying these circles around. And I finally pointed to my shoulder to my American flag and then made like a pistol symbol with my hand. And then the guy mouths basically like, Oh, this guy was shooting at you. And so I nodded he wasn't shooting at me, but he was shooting at the ground guy. So close enough. Right. And he just like takes the dude to the ground, flex cuffs and they drag him in the compound. Like, yes. <laughs> like it was just adrenaline pumped uh, awesomeness. Like that was awesome. Well, were you guys <laughs> not to get in a lengthy discussion on ROE, but were you guys armed? And if so, could you have employed? And if not, why are you flying around Afghanistan? Not, but I, I mean, what were the options available? I guess. <laughs> Yeah. Like that was our question. It just got to the point where I don't even know the correct answer. Cause we just, we were always wanting the same thing as it progressed. We we're just kind of like, we have so many restrictions on us right now and it's just getting worse and worse. Like anytime we thought it couldn't get worse, it would finally, we're just like, if you guys don't want us here, then, yeah. then just yeah. let us go home. If we can't do our jobs, like if we have to basically start recording every engagement and going through like all these things are probably still secret. So I can't really divulge like every single step. It was just a long process that was way longer than it should be. And it was basically just to ensure that you were covering your own ass that you wouldn't go to jail. If you let a weapon go without all the proper gates being met, like that was on your head. Like even if you saved some of our guys. And so that was the most frustrating thing is like, you knew, like, I got a 50 cal, I got rock, I have everything I can do. Like, I know where the fire is coming from. I know this is an enemy, but I can't do anything about it because I can't get authorized because whoever's supposed to be authorizing it right now is too afraid to let us authorize. <laughs> you know, they're too afraid to right. release the authority. And it would just yeah. be so frustrating. Well, I have a JAG friend I've been trying to convince to come on the show to talk about rules of engagement and some of these issues because it's somewhat, I would say, easy for people who aren't out there having to deal with it to impose certain restrictions. And of course, that's the whole premise of Lone Survivor, the book and the movie, is that, okay, these guys are compromised and now they're kind of stuck and it ends up costing three of them their lives. And of course, you could debate that very brief summary. But ROE, I think since at least Vietnam has been kind of a thorn in the combat soldier and airman's life as far as, okay, I have to live within this, but you don't know how difficult you're making it for me. So anyway, I didn't want to get on too much of a tangent of that. But in the end, it sounds like you guys got the guy, basically. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, he was apprehended. You know, it was like, it was pretty cool. (laughs) You know, that's exactly what I wanted to happen. So, And on just a a familiarization flight as well with your uh, outgoing uh, unit. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I was like, one of the first flights in Kandahar. I was like, really? Is this how this is going to go? go. Awesome. All right, man. Well, hey, I've got a couple quick listener questions for you, and then we'll wrap this up. Dyslexia's question about personal weapons was already covered. You talked about your M4, which is, for those who aren't aware, basically like a modern-day M16, if you'll forgive me. And again, your Army buddies are cringing. But did you guys also carry a pistol of some sort, I'm guessing? Yeah, all the M4, it's like an M16 with a 14 and a half inch barrel. It's in a collapsible stock. That's all it is. Yeah, we carried the Beretta, which I'm so glad that the Army changed out the handgun. I was never a fan. I don't know many people who were. 
but you basically would carry that, you know, I carried it up on my armor, kind of up on my chest. Some guys carried it on their side. It, mm-hmm. it was just kind of however you were most comfortable. And then, uh, you know, the loadout was you could carry just a couple mags, just the bare minimum. And some guys look like Rambo. It would just completely <laughs> up to them. All right. And then you already covered Joe Kunzler's question about Amber Smith's danger close. Sounds like you uh, enjoyed that book. How about Donald Weller wants to know how does the army plan for and deal with fast movers, so enemy fighters, let's say. And if you would rather me punt, I can ask this one next week for our Apache guy. But, I mean, you needed a fairly permissive environment, I'm guessing. Yeah, that's pretty much outside of my realm. I mean, we had the JTACs, you know, or, or just however. I mean, fast movers for me was more like, oh, let's just get out of the way. <laughs> like Amber Smith's book even said, you know, she almost got run over by, I think, right. like a French Mirage in the Tagab right. where I used to fly. I was reading that and I was yeah. laughing because I totally know exactly what she was talking about. They come cruising through that valley. So me and fast movers yeah. was generally just get out of the way. <laughs> You're implying the good guy fast movers, but the bad guy fast movers can be a problem too, of course. Yeah. I, I mean, I never encountered any Afghan enemy aircraft. Right. I don't think they existed much after we got there. All right. And then the last question you pretty much touched on as well. It's from Jevo. I don't, never know how to pronounce this, but uh, the Kiowa warrior looks lightly armored. How much enemy fire could it sustain and still make it back to base? And, and I guess this is kind of a trick question because it could take a lot of, I'm guessing, bullets in places that don't matter, but only one bullet in a place that does is going to probably bring it down. That is probably the best way I could say it. <laughs> yeah. There's all the electronics, you know, so I mean, obviously, yeah, just just a really lucky shot might just get the thing right where it counts. But uh, I think it was probably like any other helicopter out there. Mm-hmm. I mean, if it's just going through the skin, it's going through the skin. But if it hits a critical component, then yeah, now you got a problem. Yeah. Did you ever come back and look at holes in your aircraft? I was super fortunate. I did not catch any. I mean, I know a couple that were kind of our bullet magnets. They did. But um, I was unscathed. (laughs) That's good. All right. That's probably better. Yeah. Awesome. All right, Ryan. Well, we can wrap this up. You've been a good sport, and we've taken a lot of your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, at this point in the show, we normally ask about what the future holds for you, and and you didn't really say what you were doing now, though you alluded to it. So you left the army and became an airline pilot. Is that true? Yeah. So I, uh, you know, I left the army in January 2015. I got hired on with PSA Airlines, which is a regional owned by Americans. So I was flying uh, CRJs for them little regional jet, you know, three different models, just basically with different seating configurations, otherwise roughly the same jet. But uh, did that for about two years. And then I got hired on with a Legion Air. They're based out of Vegas, but most of the, their larger operations are here down in Florida. So bought a house, moved down here to Florida, and I was flying the uh, MD-80 for them. And that thing's pretty much finally met the end of its life. It was a giant dinosaur of an airliner. <laughs> uh, so then we got rid of those uh, across our fleet. We all transitioned over to the Airbus. So that's what I'm flying now down here in Florida. Okay. And I'm on my side time. You know, I spent like the last five years, I took a bunch of journal entries down, like while I was in Afghanistan during my deployments and just kind of in the interim, you know, I'd talk to peers. I took lots of photographs and just tons of journal entries. I pulled them all together and I hired a professional editor as I had promised my grandmother that I would, you know, one day I'd do something with all this material I had because she was like, you know, a lot of people don't understand or know what's going on over there, especially with you guys. Like, so she actually passed away when I was in Kandahar and I'd promised her that I would publish it. So I hired an editor, pretty proud of how the manuscript turned out. So now I'm just trying to find an interested uh, agent or publisher to publish it. Yeah. So that's kind of the the new push, you know, aside from just doing my daily flying is just trying to get that out there. And, you know, so the title is going to be scouts out and kind of hearkening to the cavalry. So anybody who wants to track the progress, I've just made a little website for it called scoutsoutbook.com and uh, they can check it out and hopefully we'll get it on, on the market soon enough. So people can kind of, who are more interested in the Kiowa and what we did and all that can take a look. Awesome. Well, we have authors who have been on this show quite a bit, and maybe when we hang up here in a second, we can reach out to some of them and see if we can get you the rest of the way into the end zone, because that sounds really cool. And I think the first count of stories are are always the uh, ones that people seem to like the most. So that sounds great. We'll see if we can't help you out and keep us posted on how it goes. Yeah, man, I really appreciate it. And I I do want to give a shout out to uh, Project Healing Waters and Fish with a Hero they've been taking a lot of veterans in, you know, especially from my generation now who, you know, people who are having trouble transitioning to civilian life and all that. And they're just, 
they're bringing you out fly fishing. It's like the coolest, most Zen thing I've ever done. Like they just teach you how to tie flies. They bring you out there and just teach you how to cast and bring you on fishing trips. So it's just really cool that there's organizations out there like that. So I just wanted to say hello and thanks to those dudes. Uh, No doubt. I'm glad you brought that up because I actually volunteered with the San Diego chapter of the project healing waters for a couple of years. Oh, no kidding. Cool. Very cool. We'd have, like you said, fly pine nights and we don't have rivers here, uh, but we have bass lakes. And so we went out with various folks that could use it. And yeah, there's just something about putting a fishing pole in your hand and getting out on the water, even if it's just a urban lake that uh, is really useful. So yeah, I'm glad you said that. That's pretty cool. All right, man. Well, uh, we usually end with stories about call signs, but I've learned from our previous guests that you guys don't really play those games too much. Any favorite nicknames for you? <laughs> no, mine, mine are pretty unoriginal. You know, my last name being Robichaux and a conglomeration of a lot of letters that end with an X. I mean, I, I got all kinds of names just off of that. I was basically just called Robo for short. Okay. I was pretty much, you know, be with a crew chief. So I'd be Mr. Robo or even with the commanders, you know, Robo. <laughs> There you go. All right, Robo. Well, that's good stuff. Really appreciate you uh, teaching me and hopefully all the listeners all about the OH58 Kiowa today. Really enjoyed our discussion and thanks for coming on the show. Awesome, man. I appreciate it. It was fun. You've been listening to Army Aviation Month here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. For more information on the show, visit our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com where you can also find a catalog of other show topics as well as military aviation-themed merchandise such as books and apparel. For exclusive content and to help support the show, be sure to check out our Patreon page. This episode was brought to you by BVR Productions and produced by our friends at the Muscle Car Place Podcast Network. Thanks for listening. So-